All right, how's everybody doing today? Good. Good. All right, so um, let me just... Uh, it's a bit of an echo in here. Yeah, this, is, this room is different. Hopefully I'm not talking down at the mic. No beard touching problems or any of that weirdness. Okay. So good afternoon. Hopefully everybody's having a great time so far. So we're coming out here to the afternoon session, day two. Um, has everybody been down and stand in, stood in the long line to get your devices and whatnot? I've been seeing a lot of people playing with them and opening the boxes and asking questions about them. That's pretty cool. It's a big line, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, and if anybody has, you know, ends up getting one of those pros and decides they don't want it, let me know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. They didn't share that deal with everybody. No, not with those of us with this color shirt. Okay, so uh, this afternoon, Josh and I are going to be talking to you guys for a little while about um, brownfield development, and, and in particular, uh, how to deal with legacy code bases via unit tests, how to use unit tests to explore and understand and extend and create and work on legacy code bases. We're going to be using Microsoft fakes a little bit during this, but not exclusively. There's a lot of things that you can do successfully using unit testing in legacy code bases that doesn't require fakes. There's places where the fakes framework is going to help you do things maybe a little shorter or a little easier. Um, and then there's places where you almost can't do anything without it. But those cases are, are we, know, we know precisely where those are, and we'll talk about that. So that's what we're going to be talking about for a little while. Hopefully, that's the talk you came for. Yeah? All right. So let me. Click here, and I'll, I'll go first and then hand it off here. So I'm, I'm Peter Provost. I'm a program manager lead in the Visual Studio ALM team. Uh, I've been working in the agile and unit testing and space for 10 plus years. In fact, I originally came to Microsoft because of work I had done contributing to NUnit way back in the day and writing articles about unit testing and .NET and web services. And I came to know Jim Newkirk, who was the author of NUnit, and he happened to be the development manager at Patterns and Practices, and he invited me to come up to Microsoft. And I've been here ever since. So I was a dev for a while, and now I'm a PM, and now I'm actually leading a great team of PMs. Uh, one of them is Josh. So I'm uh, Josh Weber. Uh, I joined the team. I, I work under Peter, and uh, I'm really passionate about uh, unit testing, basically. Uh, you know, the unit testing space, uh, Microsoft fakes, basically, you know, how do you verify, how do you design code so that it's testable? Um, my contact information's up there. Um, yeah, we love, we love to hear from you guys, so if you have any feedback, we're going uh, to leave a few minutes at the end for questions and things like that, but um, uh, if, this is a small enough room and the lights are on, so if you have a question while we're going, because we're going to be doing a bunch of coding demos, if you have a question while you're going, raise your hand and one of us should see you and we'll, we can call on you. We would ask that you, if you can, get to a mic, but if you can't, we promise we'll repeat back the question, okay? And then we'll leave a little bit of time at the end as well. All right, let's continue on here. So we want you to kind of think about um, kind of a principle to, that's going to guide the talk, that's going to sit underneath everything we're going to talk about today. And it's the idea that we're going to use tests not, ne not necessarily and not primarily as a mechanism for testing or for verifying. But we use them, especially when working with legacy code bases, as a way for us to confidently make changes to that code. Now, Josh and I are going to define legacy code as older code. That's one, at one definition. But I'll, I'll go so far as to define any body of code you have that doesn't have tests. If you don't have tests, it's legacy. Because the moment you walk away from it, you don't know anything about it. When you have tests, you know a lot about it. The tests tell you a lot. And so what we're going to do is go down that path with a, legacy code, with a body of code where we don't have tests. And we're going to use them to learn about the code. And then by doing that, put ourselves in a position to confidently make changes to that code. And of course, we get the side effect of tests that verify and, and allow us to grow and better understand what it is that we're doing. Let's go back. So as Peter said, what is legacy code? And I'm going to make the statement that any code without tests is legacy code. You know, we usually think, like in this picture, legacy code is old code or it uses some esoteric technologies that we're not familiar with. But the fact of the matter is, is that anything that's not tested, that doesn't have kind of that test safety net in place, is legacy code. Um, it, it's code that we're always going to be reluctant to change. It's code that we tell our bosses 
that's going to cost a lot more than you think it's going to cost. It's the code that we say, we don't want to do this feature because it's really risky. The, the risk is, is more costly to us than the new value from the new features. And that's a, it's a bad place to be in and, and, and one that we find ourselves in all too frequently. And uh, you know, I, I was talking with Peter a lot this morning over, over breakfast over this, and I, I was asking him this question, what is legacy code? And, and Peter made a comment that I, I thought was pretty funny. And uh, he basically said, I hate any code that wasn't written by me. <laughs> <laughs> and then we kind of chuckled, and he actually followed it up with, I hate any code that was also written by me more than six weeks ago. <laughs> so legacy code exists all the time. We have to deal with it. There's not really a way out of it. Um, we're going to show you some techniques for, for how to basically address it. Yeah, but you laugh because you agree. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> so we get into the essential question of why do we test at, at all? And they provide a, a lot of value to us. Uh, testing in general provides us a, an ability to, to learn about how code does. It provides us a way of understanding code by setting forth assumptions, some, some thought process that we have, an assumption of the behavior of this piece of code, and then explicitly define it in, in a test that says, this is an assumption that I believe to be true, and I want to always be true. And in addition to that, it, it helps us to verify where we're at, to, to basically say that this assumption needs to be true, or bad things will happen in the future. Tests help us to reduce risk and reduce the fear of change. It's really the, the reluctance to change that, help, that tests help us escape out of. If we have a lot of tests, if we're really happy with it, if we have nicely tested code, we feel comfortable. We say, sure, I'll change that method, I'll add that new feature, I'll, I'll take that on. It's not a big deal. And the last thing we test for is it really, it really guides design. Testable code is inherently better designed. It's, it's, it's more encapsulated, it's able to be shared, it's reused in at least one place in your test, and, and by definition, it, it, it's better code. So the big problem with legacy development is, how do I write the first test? Now that I'm here, what do I do? How do I get started? And, and everybody knows taking that very, very first step, as small as it may be, is, is always the hardest way to, to get started. So the, the, the first step that you really want to take is um, a little bit different than probably how most people think about tests. Most people think about tests as verification, um, setting forth what the test does. In reality, they're, they're actually an outstanding tool just for understanding. You, you come to legacy code, you're not familiar with it, you don't know what it does, and tests are an outstanding way to just explore the code. Um, try things out, poke it, see what it does, look at the results. Um, they'll confirm what you believe to be the behavior, and you can, once you figure out what the behavior is, you can then write a test that morphs from an uh, exploration test to an actual pinning test, the, the idea being that you pin that behavior so that it does not change. And the, the essential idea here is that when your code changes, you want it to be intentional, not accidental. It's always better to, to change code and you expect it to just do one thing, it's the unintended consequences that always come back to bite you in the end. So, to start, we tend to start where it's easy. Pick something you know. It's, it's the most logical place to start. Find something that you know, some behavior, some understanding that you have. Go ahead and just pin that down. You don't have to worry about t tackling the entire problem. Just start small, work your way up. Pick something you know. Once you have it pinned down, once you feel comfortable with it, pick something else. The interesting thing that this is gonna create is that as you go through this process, pinning one thing, pinning another, what it's going to turn into is that by pinning down two things, it basically makes it so that you know the third thing. You know, as you pin more, you start to learn more. As you start to learn the code better, you're going to know what next steps to take. And then the other essential fact is stop. Don't keep writing unit tests forever. Eventually, you have to stop, make your actual change, and, and, and get out. You know, there's something, when, when I was at TechEd in Europe last year, uh, we were in might not be, yeah, it was last year. We were in Amsterdam last year. And I was giving a talk on unit testing. I'm sure some of you have seen me do this for a few years now. And the guy came up to me afterwards and he said, so I'm, I'm not really sure how to ask this question. Um, 
But you know, we don't have any tests, and we're interested in doing testing, but we really don't know how to get started. Does we don't have there? any. How many of you guys are in that situation? Yeah. All right, so I'm going to give you the exact same answer I gave him. Write one. <laughs> one. You're infinitely better off than you were before. Like, you're not going to get a better ROI ever than that first test, OK? <laughs> All right. The second one's pretty good, too, but the first one really rocks. Yeah. Right? Your manager so will be really happy on your code review. You said, I improved code coverage by, a by infinite an infinite amount. amount. Yes. <laughs> right. So, um, it, and, and I'm not kidding. Find something that you really understand about the code, something you can confirm. Now, you know, Josh is saying here, you know, stop when you know enough. And that idea of stopping is very important. And you're going to see us as we get through the actual code explorations we're going to do. I really would never advocate that you write a bunch of tests for code that you're not going to change, code that works, code that's shipped, code that's deployed. I mean, there's that philosophical, agilista, TDD guy in me who says, of course, go for it, dude, write them all. But no, but then there's the pragmatic guy who says, bang for the buck, man. That code works. I shipped it five years ago. It's never been touched, and it's not going to be touched. I get no value from writing tests here. Don't. But if you find yourself needing to make a change, don't you think a test is going to help you a little bit? So pinning down and defining that current behavior is going to put you in a position to be able to do that. And that's really where we're going with this. So playing off that idea of what do you test, the most important thing to test is test the code that you're going to change. Don't try to test everything. Don't try to increase code coverage. Just test what you're going to change. It's the most important thing. It just Test that first. After that, try to test the code that's going to affect the thing that you're going to change. You know, th this is very driven. With legacy code, you're very driven for a specific task. You have some action that you want to take, some change in behavior that you want to make. Pin down the areas that you care about. Pin down what's changing. Pin down the things that affect it. And pin down the things that will help you understand the area that you're working in. Otherwise, you'll be overwhelmed with the, the scope of the problem. And moving over. What do you not test? <laughs> you know, Don't just test to get higher code coverage. Don't come in with a, a, a goal of, we're just going to pin this all down. We're going to have unit tests. It's not directed by any action that you need to take. It, it, it doesn't really help you it, unless it's an area that you're going to be changing. Don't test irrelevant edge cases just because they might occur. That, you know, Don't test unrelated code that works. If it works, it works. You don't have to worry about it. It's not where you're changing. Leave it alone. You get no ROI. And don't test anything that doesn't add value. Don't test coordinating methods that just call a bunch of other methods. Don't test areas where, by inspection, you know that it's going to work. If it, if it does something really simple that, that is always going to work, there's no need for a test there. You know, as, as TDDers, we've said for years, you know, don't test generated code. That one seems pretty obvious when you first look at it, right? I don't need to test code that a machine generates. Uh, any more than I should write tests that test the .NET framework, right? Now, what is interesting is, is to write unit tests as an exploration of a framework to understand them. But I don't know that I keep those. I sometimes write them for a little while and then toss them. Um, but again, this idea of test what you need to test, test what adds value to you, is really kind of just applying a dose of pragmatism here. Right? There is no value in testing generated code. And if, if you're not going to touch something that's old and stable and reliable, then there's no value in testing that one either. All right, so we're going to enter into what this looks like. We're going to just take a bit of code here and, uh, and write a pinning test for it. And I believe my font looks big enough. Can you guys in the back read the code in the editor? Bigger. OK? I'm going to have to. Make sure I can type. I, I, the font sizes in the test window and things, I'm going to leave small just so we don't lose too much real estate on them. Um, in fact, I'm just going to let that guy get small, and we'll take a look here. What we're looking at is uh, an ASP.NET MVC app. So we're looking at a controller class. And we don't have any tests for it. Pretend. You saw some over there in that window. But this class doesn't have any. <laughs> All right. Um, we're entering into this with, with no knowledge. And we're looking at, at, in particular, there's an action on this controller called the edit action. Right, so we can see here that it says it's a, for, just from, from in, inspection, we can d detect that this is an HTTP post. It, uh, it takes a service ticket, and it has these two different code paths, which are both going to result in a return statement. 
Now, if we wanted to find, if we found ourselves wanting to make change here, before we make change, we need to make sure we do some of these pins, put some of these pins in the code. Michael Feathers also calls these characterization tests, if you've read his book, Working Effectively with Legacy Code. And by the way, if you live in this world, and since you're here in this talk, I'm going to presume you do, go buy that book. And it's not just because I'm friends with Michael. It really is probably the best book in the space, regardless of what language or platform you work on. Um, so we're going to get started here, and we're just going to start writing some tests that kind of take us through looking at this method. So I'm going to go over to um, a test class that I've already created. And let me zoom this guy in a bit, too. Is that OK for you guys? All right, got to help me out back there. Uh, I'm going to. I'm a bit of a keyboard junkie snippet kind of a guy, so Josh is going to help us out by when I just do things on the keyboard that look like they're for free. Um, he's going to help us out by explaining what I'm doing. He sat and watched me code a little while ago. So if we take a look at this edit action, the first thing I want to check is that let's go ahead and try to see, talk about this first path here. So I'm going to say when the model state is valid, it's going to redirect to the details. So I, I'm one of those guys who likes to name my things really well. So I'm going to say edit action redirects to details when model state valid. Excellent. Yeah, but you know what that means now, right? You don't have to go digging through these. These test one, test two, test three. What's that for? OK. So I know I'm going to want to have one of these controllers. So let's just try newing one up and see what happens. We start to learn a lot by just working with it. And this is a service ticket controller. Did you guys see that, uh, that trick? That was new for me today. I guess I'll do it again. All right, so the class is service ticket controller, STC. And I'm going to type capital STC. And the IntelliSense has already filtered it for me. And then I just hit tab. Done. Covering other people's material. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's great. Well, and if you didn't go to the Visual Studio tips and tricks thing that I I think it might be later on in the week. You should. Um, was it this morning? Yeah. So he and I are friends. We've been trading emails for years. And every now and then, one of us finds one and sends a mail off to the other guy going, dude, look at this great thing I found. OK. So we can see it's not letting me compile here. It's already starting to be angry. And by the way, I'm going to give you just a, just a bit of a heads up here. I am using Preview Visual Studio 2013 bits. So there are a couple things in here that, that you don't have in your 2012 product today but that you will get when you see the preview bits later in June. Um, but for the most part, everything we're doing is, is normal. And if I use any of the features that are preview-only features, I'll be sure to let you know. The test running, the test authoring, the fake stuff, that stuff you have now, OK? All right, so it's not letting me compile because this, this, uh, this guy needs a bunch of things. Uh, this, this controller class depends on a whole bunch of things. And we can see it's got a bunch of interfaces. So um, I'm, I'm going to kind of cheat here and take advantage of the fakes framework. Uh, in a very loose kind of a way. The Frakes framework can automatically generate stubs for interfaces, which are just rep placeholder objects. I don't really know if I care about any of them, so I'm just not going to care about them very much. So we can see that the first one it wants is an iCustomer repository. So I'm just going to say new S for stub, iCustomer repository. And what's the next one he wants? He wants an iEmployee repository. And then so as Peter I mentioned, service ticket repository. Go ahead, Josh. As he's going through this, you notice he's not creating a variable. He's not keeping track of these in any way. There, there's a principle here of uh, you're not going to need it. So just go ahead and write your test, throw what it needs, and worry about it later. If it turns out that you need access to these objects, you can always add that back in there. Yep. There's no need to, to design it up first. Just go quickly. All right, what's it mad about now? Oh, yeah, I get into that habit from doing the, the, you know, the fancy new constructor initialization trick. I just leave commas on the end of everything. It doesn't work there. OK. Good. So let's see. Now, we have our controller. If we go back and look at the code. In fact, I'm going to set these two bits of code side by side. It doesn't work always so well at this font zoom, but we'll try our best. Let me try something here. If I do 125, can you guys see it OK? How's that? Is that 125 all right? OK. Yeah, but the line numbers are good, because when I want to tell you, look here, I can tell you where to look. So again, we, we, we've got ourselves to where we can call into here. So we'll do a controller.edit. And we need to give him a service ticket. And again, I don't care about that either. So uh, 
Okay. So what we're going to try to do is we want to get ourselves into here. And so I need to try to figure out what can I do to try to make sure that we enter into this if statement. And I'm not really sure what's going to get in there. In fact, I'm not even sure if right now the model state would be valid. Does anybody know MVC really well? Is the model state valid? Invalid? Uh, It'd be invalid? I don't know. So since we, I don't know, we had no idea. I'm going to do this. <laughs> well, we'll find out. What I'm doing is I'm effectively writing an assert in my test that I fully expect to fail. But it's going to tell me something, because I guarantee you it's not that terrible string I typed there. So I'll just go ahead and run that test real quick. We might have gotten lucky. <laughs> that would be really <laughs> lucky to get that one. Yeah, no, right. actually, I do this all the time. Right? I've seen people, what they'll do is they'll set a breakpoint, and they'll step in, and they'll go to the watch window. And there are cases where you're going to have to do that. But if I can just quickly grab the value and, and can do an assert on it, I get to stay here, stay in this context. You can see the test did fail. And now I'm using a, 20, uh, a Visual Studio 2013 feature, this little indicator here, which lets me go and just try to see what happened. Right, so I expected a system string, and I got true. OK, so that means it was valid. All right. So now I can actually know that at this point, it is going to enter into this chunk of code. So I don't really need to confirm that anymore, because that was me mostly writing a bit of code to learn how MVC worked, because it was faster than going to the docs. OK. We'll get rid of that test now, and we can start to enter into this chunk of code over here and think about what we want to explore here. So we can see that it's going to call insert or update. It's going to call save, and then it's going to redirect to that action. Well, let's try to take those in order. And it's calling insert or update on, um, um, on, the, on the service ticket repository. And you know what, though? I'm just realizing. I'm going to start getting into some ugly stuff there with figuring out how to know it called something. I know one thing I can at least be sure of. We could cross this line off the list, this 185, right? So we could do that. We know that it should give us back something. Hmm. Well, I um, wonder what it is. Don't know again. Let's do that one more time. Don't have a result, so let's make one. OK, good. Run the test again. And I'm using the keyboard shortcut Control R T to run the test that the cursor is currently on. Just makes my life easy. Um, although, I, one of the other tricks that I'll share with you that I also do always is if you open the Test Explorer window up here on the side, there's this little button up here at the top, Run Tests After Build. So now I don't even have to remember to run them at all. But I wanted to just run this one, so I did. And let's see. So it gave me back a redirect to route result. Well, given that this says redirect to action, that's probably the right thing to do. All right, so what, this is about my code, right? Making sure it returns the correct kind of a thing. So I am going to write a test that I'm going to keep. And what I'm looking for is an instance of type. I'm going to check the result. And I want to be a type of redirect to route result. Redirect to route result, RTRR. OK. So there's another test I can run. And this is, the, this is one I'm certainly going to keep, confirm that I got back the kind of a thing I expected. In just a minute, we're going to want to check to make sure that its values are set correct. Because of course, this controls what MVC does. This says jump to some new page. So we're going to have to make sure that it has the correct things in it. But we can at least check, and we see we got our green here. Happy, happy, keep moving. There's an interesting pattern here that, that Peter is basically following. He, he's keeping this assert, whereas he threw the previous one away. And, and the difference between those two asserts is that the first one was just us understanding the functionality of the model state, which we didn't want to read the docs, or, or the docs were maybe not as informative as they could have been. And, and so we wrote a test to, to try to understand that. But we can go ahead and assume that the model state is working properly. It's, it's not our code. Mm -hmm. we, we want to test the parts that we care about in our code base, not the .NET framework. However, the second test is our code. It, it, it controls what we return. and and the behavior that our code does. And so that is an important test to keep around, because that's, a, that's a, not an understanding assertment statement. That's a now a pinning uh, statement. Right. So well, let's see if we can dig into the values of that result, right, and make sure that it actually did the right thing. Well, um, we can see that if we look over here that the construct, this, this method is being handed two things. 
It's being handed a new generic object that has an ID in it, and it's being handed the string details. So we should be able to get those out. And I'm going to try my testing trick again of just poking at something with an ugly string. And let's see, if we do result dot, well, that's not very good. Well, because it's actually at this point untyped. Because if we look at what the edit method returned for us, it just returned an action result, which is a, an abstract base class. OK, fine. So we can say it is a typed result. And we'll take the actual result and cast it to the real thing, which, as we said, is a routed redirect to return result thingy. Excellent. So Peter, why'd you, uh, why didn't you just use a, a typecast there? Why'd you use the as? Why don't I use the as? Um, if I use a typecast and the type is not a valid, trans, uh, a valid conversion, which we know isn't true because of the previous test line, but it's a habit of mine because what I want is I actually don't want this line to be the one that throws. I want this line to be the one that throws, the one where I try to use it. And so I will often use as. Um, there's good reasons to use them and to not use them in certain situations. I wouldn't say I always use them, but in this kind of a case, I will typically because I know I want the throw to go down one. I don't want it to happen there. I want it to happen when I use it. Just lets me dig into the problem better. All right, so now that we are at a typed result, we can actually look. And I think it might be the route name. That detail looks like it might go to the route name. Well, we'll find out here because we'll just go ahead and run it again. And helps if I hit the right keyboard shortcut, doesn't it? All right, so we're going to go off and run that. And this is going to let me see. I'm going to see if I can find this details. And um, should come back. Here we go. Hmm. It's actually empty. That's All right, so that's clearly not what I wanted. Well, I said sometimes you have to do it. So I'll put a breakpoint on the test. And this time I'll debug the test. So I'm going to just, it's a control R, control T. It's fine. We'll get in here and we can take a look at results. There it is, our redirect to route result. Redirect to route result. And when we look in here, yep, empty string wasn't there. What's this thing? Oh, great, a dictionary. <laughs> Two things in it, ID and action. Those look promising. I don't want to look at that one. Ah, details and zero. Details and it's probably a zero. OK. So we found it. It's down here in the route values. All right, so I'll push stop, and we'll get right back in here, turn that breakpoint off. Now we know what we want to look for. And I'm just going to go ahead and take a stab at this and hopefully get it right the first time out of the gate. So I'm going to say 0 is the typed result, route values, it's a dictionary. Is it action? ID. ID. Oops. And then we'll do another one. And that was details, right? Typed result, route values, action. And if all goes well, this test will now pass. And assuming it passes, and I didn't do anything terribly bad here, you can look, and we have now pinned down, please pass. We've, we will now have pinned down that first branch of this if, if else statement. There we go. Um, we haven't totally pinned it down, right? There's a couple things we didn't confirm. We didn't confirm that it made these two, uh, these two calls here, right? We didn't confirm that it did these two things. Those seem relevant. So if we were going to continue much deeper into this, we would probably want to get into those. I'm going to show you some techniques for doing that in just a few minutes. That's why I'm not going to do that quite yet. But we've pinned this down. And we also could continue pinning this down. But if the change I want to make, if the bug I'm fixing or the task I'm working on is up here, there's a really good chance I would not bother pinning this bottom section. Now, it kind of makes me feel a little dirty. I'm on one of those, I'm on one of those halfway places here, okay? Right? The, the Agilista is waking up and saying, no, man, you're changing this method. You need to cover the whole thing. Um, but at the same time, what if this thing was big? And we'll talk about big methods in a little while, too. You know, do I have to do the whole thing, really? I only, but I'm only going to work here? And so we'll talk about some techniques that might let us get to there. Go ahead. So hopefully you got a, a little bit of a glimpse, and you'll see more of it as we continue. 
of how I was using the test to explore the behavior of the system. Right? I, I was literally asking questions of the running code. And we often will use the debugger for that. The problem with the debugger sometimes is the debugger, especially if you're doing F5 against your real app, then the whole thing is coming up. Services, databases, UI pieces, queues, who knows what's going on in there? And it's very difficult to control the flow of where you get want to go. So instead of getting your answer back in a second or two, you're getting your answer back in minutes. And when we want to try to do this frequently, that just kills the, kills the round trip, right? And so I was able to define kind of what this method was doing. They become the specification of this method. Right? I was incomplete at this point, but if I kept going for another 10 minutes, I would have done. The whole method would have been completely locked down and pinned. And I would have defined that thing. And I'm running them constantly. I mean, honestly, every time I get to a state where I compile, I, pro I, I can compile, I will run them. And as you saw, I'll turn on the flag that says, just do that for me. And I'll just keep working my way through this until I have defined the behavior of that method sufficiently for what I want to, uh, so that I can feel confident to enter into the code. And once I've covered enough, I'll stop. I'll stop, I'll bail out, just like we did here, and we'll move on to the next bit of the conversation. So I think that, uh, that, that idea of, of running your tests frequently, keeping them going, is, is really important. You know, uh, decreasing the cycle between uh, when you're writing a test and getting test results and, and seeing the actual code, it, it's really important to try and keep that short. Run your tests frequently, turn on the compile after build, uh, continue to build. So the, the next problem that we're going to, do you have a question? So we, we kind of went through uh, like two phases. And the, the phases is the first phase we came into legacy code that we don't know what it does. We, we don't know how, where, how this code works. And we're kind of in this like curiosity phase where we're trying to figure out what it does. And you know, we could use the debugger. We could, we could hit F5 and just run through it. And we could read the code. Uh, another tool in our tool chest is write tests, right? Tests al allow for, for very uh, targeted, like, uh, um, stimulation of the, of the code to see its behavior. And then we can write asserts to, to kind of do that. And eventually we get to a point where we feel like we're no longer exploring the code on our test, that, that now we're, we're, we know what it does. Uh, we feel like we're fairly confident. And, and we're basically going to codify those, those conf confident statements that we make in our mind, those, those assertions that we make in our minds naturally as developers. We're going to basically codify them into a test. And that those are going to become our new validations. Those are going to become our new uh, pinning characterization test, that they lock the behavior down to what we just discovered. Now when we come back later, six months later, we have to make a code in the same place. Now those tests are in place. They show us exactly what we learned before. We can read the tests. They'll show us what we learned. They'll show us the assumptions. We have a, a nice safe place that will help us for understanding. The, the code is just a little bit better than it was before. Yeah, so while building them, we're learning. We're learning what the method does, what, it, what, what its edge cases are, what its behaviors are. And when we're done, we get for free a formal specification of what this method's behavior is. And if we decide we want it to be different or we don't like it, we have a tool that allows us to know how we've changed it. And we didn't have any of that before we started. And that's why the tests are a nice way to go this. So you no, so there's a couple things going on here. This is a preview build. It's a virtual machine. It's a tiny little laptop. And it's, yes, they, we're not happy with the performance of this build of that test run right there. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. The test itself time was uh, like very short. Yeah, like the, the, that test was running in a couple hundred milliseconds. There was a little bit of lag time going on in the test engine. I can actually see here how much long it was. 59 yeah. milliseconds was that test run time. So, I, so we've got some stuff going on. Yeah, I think we'll. Uh, so but it is a preview build, so, so please the, <laughs> bear with us on yeah, that. Yeah. So our next uh, big problem is that. Uh, well, that was a fairly decent sized method that had just a, probably a few tests could lock it down. Uh, sometimes we run into this problem where uh, I can't test this, it's way too large. And uh, I have a story to tell you guys. Uh, when I was a very, very junior developer in college still, and uh, learning Java and maybe my, I believe, like third programming class I'd ever taken, uh, we were doing Java Swing GUI development. And uh, we were going along, and, and we, it was, everything was going fine. I was on a team, and we were programming and, and our code eventually stopped compiling and we couldn't figure out we spent we spent like three four hours one late night 
getting increasingly stressed out about why, are, why wouldn't my Java code compile? And eventually we determined that uh, I actually hit the compiler limitation on the maximum size for any method, which at the time was some uh, really large number, like 8,000 lines or something like that. Uh, the compiler would just throw this weird error that says I can't compile this method. And we went, oh, wow, and we were happy to discover it. And our solution to the problem was, was really straightforward. We just, we just added a call at the very end that said call giant method two. And it went ahead and it went just passed on right down. The compiler was super happy. And we went right on by that, uh, that the compiler limitation on the size of a method. <laughs> so uh, it does happen. I, I'm sure you guys all have similar stories uh, about giant methods you've come across in, in your lives. Uh, methods cover a lot of stuff. Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny. I mentioned Michael Feathers before in his book. Um, he and I were at a conference once, and I was talking about this problem of, uh, that, that's been a favorite topic of mine for years, which uh, unintended consequences, right? Where you, a team makes a rule, and some weird behavior occurs. And I was talking about the team that, a team that created a rule that said no method could have more than 20 lines in it. And um, they went into the code, and they found this three, this three or 400 line long method, this big long thing. And so they just you know, selected 10 lines and extracted it out and called it one, and selected it and called it two, and extracted it out and called it three, and called it four. And that was his story to me about a team who dealt with this. And then he asked me this really fascinating question. He says, don't you think that was probably better anyway? And I realized it probably is. It's not, you're not done. It's like you took one step and you have four. But they did stop after one. So that's why I would say, no, you weren't done being better, but it was a step in the right direction. Um, but so it sounds like you guys just kind of hit that approach because the compiler told you to, but. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, at a bare minimum, you isolate uh, scope, variable scope, right? You know that the variables in the above scope are isolated from the bottom. I mean, it, it does help. Mm -hmm. like even, even what would be trivial uh, changes do, yep. do make a difference. So as we all know, large methods are painful. They do the world. There's methods that call every time you do anything at all in the system. You have to call this method. It updates every value in your, in your system. Every time you want to make a change, you have to go right back to that, that hard method that's just a painful issue to deal with. And it turns out that I can't change anything without having to go to this, this painful destructive method. And it, it's really hard to deal with this without kind of a, a, an architectural approach like uh, you know, separating out uh, methods, changing calls. Uh, you really can't exactly do it just, just through uh, like uh, testing and, and such. You really, you really want to take kind of an architectural refactoring type approach. So when you have a method that's large, what do you do with it? You smash it into little pieces. You just <laughs> scatter them all over the place and, and try, to, try to make some sense of it. So uh, there, there's this uh, interesting catch-22 that, that's talked about very frequently in that um, you shouldn't refactor code unless you have uh, test coverage. And then uh, you can't actually write unit tests without <laughs> refactoring the code. So we, we kind of uh, skirt this issue a little bit by um, trying to rely a little bit on automated refactoring tools. Uh, you know, there's an academic um, theoretical discussion as to whether refactoring is provably the, the same and changes code or, or does. But Generally speaking, the, the, the basic refactorings that, that the code tools do it, whether it's Visual Studio or, or other tooling, they're, they're pretty safe. They're, they're, they have a very low chance of actually breaking your code, and they help you to escape that catch-22 cycle of, I don't have tests, so I don't, can't make changes, but I need to make changes to, to get something testable and understandable. So refactoring tools can kind of help you to take a step back, escape out, um, extract that method to, to a separate private method that, that makes sense for you. In addition to that, the, the, the real skill that you're doing when you're looking at a large method is that they, they definitely violated solid principles, and, and they really violated the, the idea of uh, single responsibility, that uh, this method clearly does too much. <laughs> it's 8,000 lines long. It did too much. Um, the, real, the real trick is to try to identify in that method what it's trying to do, uh, especially around the area where your code is changing, and to try to find that one piece of task and pull it out to a separate method that's well-named and, and potentially can be then pinned or uh, locked down so that you can actually get somewhere where you have a manageable piece that you can actually work with that does some behavior that can actually make sense and, and fit in your working memory in your brain. And you basically want to pull each of those pieces out individually and test them. You know, test each task responsibility. Try to create a little bit better of an architecture. Try to attack this method um, in a kind of holistic uh, overall scope. All right, so let's go back in and look at some code. So the app that we're playing with here today, um, 
actually was, for me, total straight up legacy code until this morning. Um, I intentionally kind of entered into this code blind. I have other bots of bodies of code I could have come to you with, but um, the, the freshness with which I had to go through and learn this code allows me to kind of share that same thing with you. And I found this method, which certainly isn't as long as the longest method that I've been told about in the world, um, which, uh, if I can just share that story with you real quick, when I first came to Microsoft Agile, t trying to teach Agile around the company, I got invited out to a lot of different product groups. And I went out to visit with one team who I guarantee you you've, you all are very familiar with their product, um, but I'm not going to mention them by name. And um, they told me that they were very, very concerned about unit testing because they had a method that had over 2,000 lines of code in it, and nobody knew how it worked anymore, and almost every execution path of the program ran through it. And they were terrified of it. <laughs> so this isn't as bad as that. But still, it allows me to show you a couple of interesting techniques that we can use to start testing and then refactoring a body of code like this. So we have this longish method. We can see it's create. Again, it's an action result. So we're going to set ourselves up with the same kind of a starting point. Um, let me go up here to the top, and we'll just start a new one. Um, let's call this create exploration. All right, so we're going to have that same startup. So I'm just going to steal this little chunk down here. And yes, I do this a lot. Lazy for copy paste. Now, as we work our way down a method, right? Here's the challenge with a really long method. So many things can happen, right? In that last one, I went straight to the end. I said, well, hey, let's just check the return type. Isn't that great? And we kind of ignored the middle. But if we're going to start thinking about refactoring pieces of this out, we're going to want to try to find chunks of it that we can remove, which means we need to identify effectively state transitions in the middle. Now, I could just do the refactoring. I could just select a chunk of code and see what happens. And in fact, a good friend of mine, Ward Cunningham, uh, the guy who invented the wiki, um, used to say to me that he really likes doing this. He'll just select an arbitrary block of code and start to run the refactoring tool and then push escape. Like he doesn't actually let it run. And he does it just to look and see what the refactoring tool thinks are the ins and outs of some arbitrary block of code. But still, let's pretend for a minute that I, I'm not just going to extract it because I'm trying to be a little more uh, rigorous about my approach. I want to understand before I start making changes. Well, one of the easiest ways to get around this is with a trick called sensors. Uh, again, this is something uh, that, that I, I got from Michael Feathers. And the problem is, what I want to do, if we look at this code here, I, I might like to stop right here. Right here. And I'd like to understand, what does created by even have in it? This is going to allow me to make sure that I get the setup of entering into this method correct and all kinds of other good things. So how can I do that? Well, when we introduce a sensor, and I've got mine hidden right here. I'm just going to take this sensor and move it up here. What I, what I end up doing is I put a variable, a public field, on the class I'm testing, and I set something into it, just set it. right? And ideally, I don't do this this return, and bail out on the rest of the method. But I've already done this once, and I know that if I don't bail out on the rest of this method at this point, it's going to fail halfway through, and it's kind of hard to figure out if my sensor got anything set correctly. Um, and since I'm just trying to evaluate up to this point, I'm going to go ahead and return out. So the sensor is just going to grab this created by. So let's just grab it like this and save it. And again, that's just a public, a public field on there. So now what I'm able to do is run it. So I can say controller.create. And we're doing this one, aren't we? I believe we were. Yes. So I'll give it a new service ticket again. And I'll check my sensor. Again, I'm not really sure what it's going to be, so I'll find out. But because that sensor's on there, I can now ask that question of that intermediate state. Josh, can you go ahead and answer? And I'll type here first, or run yeah. this test. Yeah, so uh, up, up, up above, this is defined as just a public member of the controller class. So we just added in a, a simple uh, variable that uh, acts as a public variable. Yeah, it's actually defined member. as an object. Yeah. Yeah, you can't use vars as fields. All right, so, so I just it's put just it as field, an object. It a, means, sure, if I end up putting a, a, um, um, a, a simple type, like a number, it's going to get boxed and unboxed. But this code's not going to stay here. This is entirely temporary. 
for the purposes of my exploration and to enable me to get to that position of refactoring. Okay, so I ran the test. It failed as expected. And if we look, value cannot be null. So it threw before it ever even got to my sensor code. So clearly I haven't, not, I haven't got something set up right. But and this is why I wanted to bail. I'm, I'm actually glad that I, in only one line of code, I've already realized I don't know what the heck I'm doing. Right? So somewhere between the top of that method and you know, this return statement, it failed. Well, clearly it's going to have to be this guy because there's a bunch of weirdness going on here. But now we know something more. Yes, we now know that the service ticket, the input parameter or something, is somehow affecting this guy. And I'm going to bet it's employee repository because I just stuck a stub in there, didn't I? Yeah. Ah, yes. So here's the employee repository right here, and I just stabbed it in there without even paying any attention to what was going on. That's probably a bit of a problem. So, um, because what's, what's happening, of course, is that that where clause, that bit of link code, is attempting to query the repository. And when I just take a stub like this and do nothing with it, it's really a dumb object. It doesn't know how to do anything except fulfill the interface requirements and return nulls for every method it has. So that's why the where was failing. All right, fine. So let's take this guy and move it out. As Josh told you, we'll move these things out when we need to. OK. Now, um, the way these, uh, these stubs work is I can basically, with them, I can override and replace chunks of the code. So I can create an implementation of the method that it was using. So it was, uh, it was using all. And all is a property. And of course, properties are actually methods that have getters and setters. So I'm going to say all get. Right? I'm going to assign to it an anonymous delegate. And I could do this with the older syntax and actually assign it to a function, but I find this keeps it right here where I'm working, shorter fingers. So let's me kind of do it in the lazy man's way. Um, let's see, we're probably going to need to return some kind of a list, right? Well, let's go ahead and figure out what that's got to be. Um, let's see, new list of employee, I think is what it's probably going to be. Let's put one in there. Has he taken that? Nope, not happy yet. And that's because it turns out it has to be a queryable, not a list. As queryable employee. How about now? Red squiggly is gone. Excellent. So now what we have is this employee repository has an implementation of that all property. So when that link code calls get on the all property, it's going to get something. It's going to be this list that has one item in it, and I control it. This is a nice thing from a testing perspective. Let's run it again. Oh, I ran it with a debugger. It's fine. Just be a little bit slower. OK, so while that's running, let's go take a look. So that's going to get us now. We think it's going to get us through here. We think it's going to get to our sensor. It's going to return something. And we now get a chance to take a look at what the sensor was. And again, it's in our test results. So we can see our sensor had null in it. That's interesting. Not really sure why. So the what, we're, what we're finding here is that, in fact, this repository is returning stuff, and it's comparing against user identity. And the user identity is the identity of the user logged into the site, OK? Um, in this system, that's kind of hard-coded to this, uh, this ugly string uh, domain Peter, which is me. But that never really got set anywhere. And in the, that, that bogus employee that I stuck into my database in my tests, um, he didn't have an identity. <coughs> he did not have an identity. So let's make him have one. Uh, demo Peter. Hopefully that's what I did. And we'll run him again. What? Two, not enough curlies. So yeah, I'm doing double layers of, uh, of constructor initialization there. So forgive me that. But it, it does keep it all in one line. And eventually, this isn't the most important bit of code. This is the setup code, the, the arrange part of our test, which is an arrange act assert kind of a thing. All right, so now we can see we still got back null. What did it's I type wrong? Case. Is it domain? See, you guys are great. Help me out. Keep me on track. 
Domain, Peter, lowercase. Got to do all our coding with a room full of 200 people. It's a great way to do coding yeah. with, with you get a whole room full of debuggers. I mean, they, yeah. you don't even have to run the compiler. <laughs> right. You don't even have to run your tests. Everybody finds every mistake before you do it. It's great. great. <laughs> all right, so at this point, we really do believe that where clause is going to pass, and we're going to get something back from our sensor. And we did. We can see that we actually got back an employee object. Excellent. So now we've figured out at least how to get that block of code at the beginning there to run. We didn't know how to do that before. Um, Right, so we have successfully made it down here to our sensor. OK. Well, let's move our sensor one little bit. I'm going to move it down here. And instead of tracking what that object was, let's actually check that this uh, ID got set into the service ticket. All right, what value got set in there? OK. Right. And effectively, I'm just confirming that I was able to get here. Now, of course, the service ticket's created ID will have already, may have already been set. So really, what we can confirm is that this if happened. In fact, let's just do this. We'll put it actually inside of the if. And we don't even need to set the value at all. Did we even get here? OK, good. So now let's, um, continuing on with our test now, We'll just say we should actually now be able to see it be true. Like we expect it is going to get there. Let's run it again. So when this guy's done, we're going to we're going to be in an interesting position because we will have worked our way down through enough of a, enough of the body of code that we've actually found a little autonomous chunk we can reuse, we can extract. Our test passed, so we did get to our sensor. So in fact, if we take a look at this, I'm going to now remove the sensor code, put it over here, come back to it in a minute. We can see that this block right here, if I were to take that block like that, basically that's taking the service ticket we were given, querying the employee database to see if we've got some information, if we do, updating the service ticket. So in other words, this is update service ticket with employee information. All right, update service ticket with employee information. Excellent. And now this method is shorter than it was. I like that. That's good. Now, when I was doing this earlier, Josh asked me a question at this point. He said, are you going to change the test so that the test points at this new method you just created? No. This method is private. I don't test private methods. As I jokingly say, I won't mess with your privates if you don't mess with mine. Um, but a private method is an entirely an implementation detail. It's an implementation detail of this method. It has nothing to do with anybody else. If I'm going to change the behavior of this method, I'm probably going to change the behavior of the private. So I don't need to test the private except through the public. Now, as you do more and more of this refactoring, as you do more and more of these extractions, you will find that you suddenly have enough of these privates that you start to wish you were testing them, because it kind of looks like there's something different there. There's, a, there's something else growing there, and it, all these guys kind of look related, and I'd like to be able to test them. What it's really saying to you is there's probably another class here. There's a whole class missing. And it might be a class that does business logic, and it might be a change to your domain model, and it might be a change to, but there really likely is something that is, is, comes about. So you, you'll extract a method, you'll extract a method, you'll extract a method, and you'll realize, extract a class, a whole new one. right? And now I want to test that class, because I'm now fully isolated. I've created a reusable unit, an object of reuse, this class. So I do need to create tests that go with it. So when other people go to consume that class, they can. But it turns out most of those tests are written. They're just hiding over here in these other ones. So I just bring them all over. It doesn't really take very long, and we've moved on. All right, so we can continue down this path for quite a while, continuing to move that sensor down the code, working our way along. And what we'll end up with is a method that has a whole bunch of call outs like this, calls out to other things to say, go help me do this, go help me do this, go help me do that. And it leaves this method with very little to do, in fact except to kind of be the coordinator. And that's why we call them sometimes coordination methods. Effectively, he makes a coordinated set of calls on other helpers. 
Because you'll also find sometimes that a little chunk of code up here inside of the if will also appear in the else. So now we're getting reused, but it's within the same parent method. So again, I don't really need to extract it out into a, a testable component because it's still totally self-contained from a logical perspective. So we continue to work our way along here, making this method smaller and smaller. And then oftentimes what happens is we discover the bug we're here to fix, the task we're here to do, whatever it is, resides very nicely within a single method like this, freestanding like this. Now, if I want to start making changes to what this method does, I might now, for that reason, take those tests out. But I don't always do it. All right, this is, again, there's that pragmatic thing. I, I, I move them out because they do something good for me, not just because all tests have to be out there. I'll move it out. The tests will define this. I'll make the changes I need to for the bug. And I've improved the, the health of the code. And I've moved this thing forward. All right? OK, so let's click that button. So much like when we were looking at this before, we're going to start small and work your way through. Okay? And in this case, what I did is I, I took advantage of a technique called sensor variables. Right? I inject that sensor into the code. It's just like putting a probe in something that they do in science or in engineering or even you know, the probe that's in your engine, checking its temperature of your car. It's the same idea. We're injecting a probe in there and says, tell me something right here. Right? And you'll move that probe around and ask it a whole set of questions, writing tests to, to ask those doing extracts out until you get some clarity about where you stand. And then you can effect effectively take this method apart through refactorings, and those tests are helping you. Yes? Uh, I think I meant sensor. And if I send said signal, I apologize. Um, I, would, I, would, I, I probably would be OK calling them either one, except as soon as I say signal, I start to think of semaphores and asynchronicity and multi-threaded, and that's not what I meant at all. Oops. Oh, yeah. My mistake. Yes, so sensor variables then. Yes, the idea is this is like a sensor in a car, that kind of thing. OK, so let's uh, see where we stand here. And we will keep on trucking. So this can get worse. It can get much worse than just long methods. And where it really starts to get ugly is when we start to find code that maybe isn't just long and complicated, but actually has external dependencies that you cannot deal with. And there's these, these dependencies can come in a whole bunch of different classes, a whole bunch of different kinds that you have to deal with. And so I'm going to start by going right into, the, right into some code just to show you a very obvious one. Um, you may have seen me do this one before, but you've probably never seen me actually write the code for it, because I sometimes just show this one on a slide. Um, but Josh said, let's write it and see what happens. Yeah. OK. Works for me. Um, so suppose you have this simple little block of code. OK? Throw if Y2K. Now, I know there's at least one or two people in here who are as old as me, and therefore they remember this. <laughs> Some people even made a lot of money on this. Right? If they turned up now, is, two, is January 1st, 2000, throw a Y2K exception. So how do you test this, right? That date time dot now is surprisingly resilient <laughs> and, uh, and insistent on actually telling you what the real date is. So how are we going to deal with that? If we wanted to start writing a test, what would we do? Well, I'll show you the, the crazy, ugly thing. There's and an easy answer, right? Hmm? There's an easy way to do it, right? What's that? Well, you just change the time. Well, exactly. I, I go down here to my clock, <laughs> and I change it. But that way, the test only works today, and it stops working tomorrow because I have to change it again. So instead, what if I took advantage of the Win32 API called System Set Time, and I did it programmatically from the test? <laughs> right on. Every time you run this test, it goes back to January 1st, 2000. So Josh and I wonder what would happen. Um, because this, this machine's like a TFS machine, which means it's got SQL and all kinds of other crazy stuff on it. And I said, I'll bet you, dude, I'll bet you it'll crash TFS. It'll be kind of neat. Well, so we ran it. And as you can see, it failed. Um, and interestingly enough, the reason it failed, if we look and see here, the is true failed. So that means line 60 failed. And the reason line 60 failed is because set system time is a, a Win32 API, and the, the DLL import that I used actually was defined so that if the Win32 API method fails, return a false. In other words, if the H result comes back false, 
It just returns a false instead of throwing. So effectively, it threw. Um, and when I was playing around with it before, I stepped into it and then checked the get last error, which is that Win32 call to try to figure out what happened, because they don't really have exceptions in C code, right? And it turned out it said insufficient privileges. Because, of course, to change the system time, you have to be an admin, and I'm not elevated right now. Which is probably a good idea, considering the things that we're trying to do with it. Yeah, yeah, well, that's probably good, right? I mean, that's exactly the kind of failure you want. Thank you for not reformatting my hard drive. Um, all right, so that's, that's a very, very obvious and simple kind of an example. And it turns out this one's really not that hard to get rid of. And um, I'm going to show it to you very quickly. So it turns out that um, I'm going to just get rid of this, all this mess here, because we're not going to mess with that crazy date time thing, OK? We're just going to instead, let me get rid of all this ugliness dragon code, too. OK, so we know we want to create up um, this new Y2K thingy. And we know we want to say, I did this before. That's because I said that. See, I told you, there's a compiler over here. <laughs> you guys are great. There we go, throw if Y2K. OK, and we are going to say that we expect this to throw. Excellent. Let's run our tests. Now, it's not going to throw because it's June, 13 years later. Wow, is it really that long ago? Yeah, it's been a while. OK, so you can see um, did not throw the expected exception is what we got back. So clearly, we have to fix that. So what we need to do is we need to make this date time dot now go away without changing it. Right, because let's pretend this is a library, right? You bought this library for $1.99, and it's your Y2K checker library, and you can't fix it because it's pre-compiled and signed and all kinds of other ugliness, and you want to keep using it, darn it. You got to get that $1.99. So we got to make that go away. OK, so this is where shims come to bear, which is the other half of fakes. Shims let us take over code, make it go away. No, don't do it. So system.datetime lives in the system reference. So over here in Solution Explorer, where it says system, I'm going to right click. And I'm going to say add a fakes assembly. And it's going to think for a minute, because it goes off and generates a bunch of new code, and new assemblies, and puts references in there. You can see a couple of new things are going to start appearing. There's one. We've got to get number two, system, and then MS Core Lab. Done. So what he's done is generated up assemblies that let me now take over that stuff, inject our own stuff right in the way. And just like with the, the stubs we were using before, they start with the word shim. So we're looking for shim date time. And there it is, system.fake shim.datetime. Okay? Now, we're going to talk to this object. Now is a static get property, read only property, on the date time class. So that means the replacement area that I have is also static on the shim type. So I do now, and then there's the get method. And just like I did before, I'm going to assign an anonymous delegate. And I'm going to return a new date time, right? So notice, I didn't change the system under test, the system I'm trying to test, that Y2K checker. Instead, what I did is I said, anybody in the world who calls date time dot now is going to get told it's January 1st, 2000, but I didn't change the system clock. It's kind of like, oh, God, we took control of time itself. <laughs> yeah. So let's run this one. Again, an RT. <clears throat> OK. And this one's going to fail. And it's going to fail for a very interesting reason. And I want to show you what it was. So I'm going to open up the Test Explorer here, pin that guy to the side so we can read it. So it turns out it failed. It's basically telling you, I'm not happy. And I'm not happy because. And then he gives you some sample code you should steal. Right? There's a big chunk of sample code there. So let me explain to you what, he's, what it's really saying. Do you remember when I said everybody in the world who calls datetime.now is going to get told January 1st, 2000? Right? It's not quite that bad. It's everybody in this app domain in this process, which is pretty much everything. It also includes the test runner. And Visual Studio. And maybe chunks of Visual Studio. And who knows what else? I bet you. The compiler, when it puts that date in your output message, uses datetime.now. And I'll bet you the test runner uses it. And who knows what else other things you might be taking over. So we actually intentionally disallow what I've done here. 
unless you provide a scoping region. We have to say only valid from here to here. So that's all we have to do to fix this code, is, is wrap it in the scoping region. And that's with that little sample. We made it so that the, uh, if you ever run into this, um, the exception you get tells you exactly what to do. Don't you wish more of them did that? Yeah. You messed up. Fix it like this. Where's my side of the room compiler? Yeah. You forgot a curly brace. All right, so now it will run. Now the exception will be thrown. The expected, expected exception check at the top of the test method will be fulfilled, and the test will go green. Yeah, this preview build is slow, Josh. We've got to fix that. We'll, we'll get into it. Yeah, he's on that stuff. All right, there we go, green pass. So there we go. We took over, we took over system.datetime um, in a kind of a fun little way, and we got to run with it. So the idea for these external dependencies is really uh, you have a complex graph like this. Things call something else, which calls something else, which calls a third thing, and then calls back to its original self, and you end up with a circular dependency. The idea is don't do what we did. Don't try to just call the system time. Don't try to control the external system. Uh, in our example, everybody laughed because it's, it's, it's funny and it's straightforward, and you think, oh, you're going to change the system time. But this is very often the, the natural instinct that everybody wants to do. They want to uh, spin up a SharePoint server that they're going to stuff uh, test data into. They spin up a SQL server and, and populate it with data that they know, and then try to do test and cleanup. Uh, they try to you know, replicate the, the system components so, so that the, the test environment is the exact same as your product environment. The, the idea is don't control the external system. You, you, you want to break the dependency, not automate the uh, control of the external system. So you really just go through and write your test and just ignore the dependency exists. Um, find the test will fail, because the parts that it needs aren't available. The system.time will fail. Uh, when you go through the test, you'll, you'll be able to identify your transition points. You, you can find through your failing test the areas where it breaks down, show you the areas where your control flow changes from your code to that external system. The idea being that when you find those transition points, what you really want to do is target that point right there and introduce a, a seam, which is another term uh, borrowed from Michael Feathers. The, the, a seam basically uh, allows you to have a place where you can inject a, um, a dependency break. So if that seam happens to be on an interface, then you can use uh, stubs and, and do a very easy kind of mocking class or a, a, a big substitute class, depending upon who you are. If it's not, and it's an external dependency that was never designed with testing in mind, it's some third-party tool, some system DLL, Microsoft Fakes provides shims. Shims allow you to go in and detour pretty much any .NET call at runtime that, that you know, you don't have to have a source code solution to this. At runtime, you can, you can inject your seam and redirect your code back to your test code to, to basically break that external dependency, which you basically break the dependency, finish your tests, and you now have an isolated test that's no longer uh, dependent upon that, that complex external setup. And I think we already... Uh, I want to show drawer. you an ugly one. Let me just show you guys an ugly one. Only take me a sec. We're still doing fine on time. Okay. We are good. All right, so... This is a, a little app that I write, and I'm always t tinkering with it. Uh, it reaches out to the internet, to the US Geological Survey, and pulls down their most recent list of earthquakes, plots them on a little Bing map, lets me figure out what's happening. So you can see California's been hit a couple times lately. Surprise, surprise. Uh, and there's one, look at that. Hey, I got friends near there. It's a little one, though. All right, so. Let's suppose that this is the, the code that we're working in. This is a legacy code base, and we need to do something. I want to point out a very interesting method. And yes, I wrote this, so that means I wrote this method interesting to be intentionally um, for this very purpose. Um, what we have here is a timer. Basically, the app every so often goes off and requeries, pulls back some data. And it's going to update the message down here in 57. You can see it. it's going to update that message again. Uh, and it's using this thing called a dispatcher timer. And the dispatcher timer you know, runs, handles the thread dispatching so that you can make sure that any UI updates you're doing are taken care of, but it generally just works like a timer. Great. So it news up a dispatch timer, and it hooks up an anonymous delegate right here. 
to the tick function. So every time the timer ticks, that little this this block of code here is going to get called. And then it says do it every one second, go. All right. So how do I test this chunk of code here? This method, because it is, is fully buried, worse than private, right? Private I can get to with reflection. Not that one. All right, it's fully buried in here. How do I get this thing out? Because ultimately, I want to be able to call that method. Because I might want to check that that method updates the string, or calls refresh data, or does something on a certain timer. There's all kinds of things I might want to check about it. And again, Shims is going to help us do that. So let's write just a really quick test to do that. 125 is what we agreed on, right? All right. So do a quick test method. One more time. OK, so we're going to, uh, again, new up one of these new main page, main page view model. And I use SUT all the time. It's for system under test. Or that way I'm remembering when I'm writing a complex test, this is the one I'm poking on. Because I might end up newing up a bunch of others, and you can kind of forget, what am I really in paying attention to here? I'm paying attention to that one. OK. Uh, apparently, I have to feed it a little bit more information. Start the timer? No, because I want to do that myself. OK, so let's see. What do we need to do now? Um, if we look at that method, we are going to want to grab a hold of this. And so just like we did with now, we want to grab a hold of this, this anonymous method. Because there is an assignment happening here. It does get attached. This method is no longer anonymous, in fact. Well, it's still anonymous, but it's no longer inaccessible because I can now pull it out of the dispatch timer. So we're going to take the dispatch timer. So now shim dispatcher timer. Right? But here's an interesting problem. This dispatch timer is hiding in here. It gets nude up in here. Again, just like the anonymous delegate, it's inaccessible to me. Well, it turns out we thought about that when we built shims, and so we can do this thing called all instances. So this is now even more global than we said before. Literally, every occurrence of dispatcher timer, regardless of where it gets nude up, static or private, we don't care. We got it. All right, so for all of them now, um, we want to grab a hold of that tick. Now, tick is actually an event handler with an add and a remove, like a property has a get or a set. So you can see we've named it tick add event handler for you. So you remember what it is. And we're going to grab that. Well, it turns out that that as a method gets passed. I'm going to type self because you can't type this. But in fact, that's the this pointer. You know that every method actually has a parameter that you never see, which is why you have the keyword this. It's number zero. So it turns out when you do this with shims, you have to remember that one, because it's, it's got to be there too. So there it is, but I can't call it this, so I'm going to call it self. And then it has the event handler itself. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take that and store it. OK? I'll store it in a little local variable called handler. And so I will say var handler equals funny little trick I do sometimes. The way I get to still be a var, but it's typed. OK, so I've done that. And now I can call sut.starttimer. And let's, before we run this, let's just have a quick peek. Make sure we're doing the right thing here. You know, I'll bet you this refresh data goes to the internet. We probably don't want it to do that while our test is running. That takes my nice little 37 millisecond test and changes it quite a bit. So let's make that guy go away. Shim main page view model. Well, I got a shim for him too. Excellent. Um, but I don't need to do all instances anymore because I have it. It's right there. It's SUT. So it turns out I can just give it one like that. Okay? So now I've wrapped him up. I want to take over refresh data. Refresh data. Excellent. You do nothing. Aw, why not? What's he saying? Ah, it needs to return something. OK, fine. Turns out he wants a task because it's all asynchronous and 
So I've got to do all kinds of weirdness here, but believe it or not, that ugly little bit of squiggle is going to work. Right? New task. There we go. So it, that's effectively a no-op, right? It's a whole bunch of empty curly braces all nested together, happily wrapped up inside a task. So now refresh data is gone. Yay, that one's gone. But you know what? Start is still going to actually start the timer. We don't want that to happen either, so let's make him go away. Shim dispatcher timer. One more time, and then we're done. All instances start equals. And go away, you. Start the timer, and we can now run our test and, and check all the values that we want to check. Exact same kind of thing we were doing before with date time, except now I'm taking over some other strange butt pit bit of the base class library of the .NET framework, and I can continue to do this all day, taking over things left, right, and center. So let's continue on here, because the little red light just came on, but we're OK. We only have two more slides, so hang with us. So we, we, we sometimes call this thing p-invoking the external system. You guys know p-invoke is that trick that I was doing when I was calling the Win32 API call, right? Call directly into something. Well, we sometimes talk about p-invoking the external system as a way of saying, you should try not to actually call it at all, right? When I took over that refresh data, no, don't call the web service. When I took over the dispatch timer, no, don't let the timer run. Don't let the database go. Get in the way. Block those things out. If you ever find yourself thinking about writing a unit test and you have to write setup code that puts 37 records in the database because otherwise the test won't pass, that's what I'm talking about, okay? We want to try to avoid that. We want to find these seams, and we want to inject them. We inject these seams, these places we can put in and <clears throat> make a spot, okay? Take over a chunk of code. Make it yours. Own it within your test, and then you really can test what you want to test, which is your code. Make those other things go away. Don't test other people's stuff. All right, so legacy code, right? Code that you are have to work in, but it doesn't have tests, you're not familiar with it, or it's somebody else's code or yours more than six weeks ago, that whole thing. Mm -hmm. It's ugly, we hate it, nobody likes it. You have to work in there, it's painful, it's risky. You find yourself wanting to make change, there's the changes you have to make, bugs and tasks and other things. Tests will help you learn about that code. They'll help you understand what it does. They'll help you specify it, define it, pin it down. And then they'll help you control it. Because the next step after that is you make a test that's a new test that is what you want it to be, different than what it is now. Because you have the one that says what it is. Copy that test. Change it to what you want it to be. Now you've got both of them. Currently, one passes and one fails. You'd like to switch them. So the, that one now fails, and this one now passes. You've now affected the change you wanted in a very controlled way. You owned every step of it. You know exactly what you changed, and the other tests tell you you didn't change anything else. That's safety net that you have as a developer. And of course, only change what you need to change. These big bodies of code have got a lot of work working stuff in them. You've shipped it to customers before. It worked. Leave it alone. Don't, don't waste time there. There's no value there for you, for your company for your customers, for your team. There just isn't. All right. I want to thank you all for coming out. Hopefully, you guys enjoyed the session. Josh, thank you very much. Thanks. And um, you guys uh, have a great rest of your time at TechEd. If you have any questions at all, Josh and I will be down at the booth a bunch, and we'll be hanging out here. Thank you. Have a great day.